But as usual, we are first going to do our sequence posts. Yay, sequences. <laughs> so let's jump right into that. Uh, as soon as I can pull up the right document. Jeez. Uh, who wants to just start us off on this? I'll go. Uh, absurdity heuristic is the first one. And absurdity bias. So absurdity uh, heuristic was... They was started out describing that heuristics aren't bad, per se. Um, usually they're actually pointing you in some direction. Like, okay, like I've... All of my experiences have led me to believe that this cause uh, will create this cause will create this outcome. So, like very briefly, it's a mental shortcut. Yeah, like, expensive things tend to be better quality. Like, yeah, that, that is one that's obviously exploitable, but it's a general truism to the point where, like, you can glance at things on the shelf and be like, "Oh yeah, this one on the bottom, ten bucks, and then this one on the top, ninety bucks." I'm betting that one's better than the ten dollar one. Yeah, it's kind of um, the thinking fast and slow thing, where you're you have your heuristics that do a bunch of mental shortcuts for you, and generally they actually work pretty well. And but sometimes because you do use all these mental shortcuts, they can cause you to have biases. Is just what he meant by the absurdity heuristic versus the absurdity bias. So when people say something is absurd as just a sort of knee-jerk reaction to a new idea or something that sort of pattern matches to things that seem like they might not be probable, but maybe this person's not operating on... They haven't sat there and done the math and been like, oh, actually, no, physics say that this probably could happen or uh, whatever other um examples he brought up yeah then that's no, a bias rather than just a yeah. heuristic and he was railing against that like probably because of people saying that ai is absurd or mm. maybe his quantum gravity stuff i don't think he started railing yet he spoke against it i believe the railing will come later oh yeah okay <laughs> but i don't know I, did you did you read it more as railing no, I uh, think I was just exaggerating. <laughs> he, he does seem to be trying to not be exactly evaluative in this first one. He's just saying, yeah, there, there are heuristics. We use them all the time. They're good. And as Kahneman said, and there, there is a fair amount of content overlap between uh, the sequences and Kahneman. Those heuristics are good so much of the time that we don't even notice when they're right. Mm. Like we're using them so just... So often they seem like on, common sense on an at least daily or, or they don't even register as common sense. They're just they're they're down to the level of reflex. Yeah. Uh, That's big, a good way brightly to colored it. pointy animal. Get away. You won't you, you, you even though there is a response in your brain from the ancestral environment that gives you those ideas, you will not be aware of them having happened. Mm -hmm. So you, you can with practice, I guess, identify when those heuristics are operating but that takes some exercise in mindfulness. Yeah. And for the most part, heuristics are defined by being things that we don't see happening, that we, don't, we aren't aware of executing in our brains. Yeah, there was the example, uh, actually, that you, I think you were maybe talking about Kahneman. I think he brought this example up of uh, if you see something that looks like a tiger, uh, obviously there's an evolutionary advantage just running the fuck away regardless if it's a tiger or not. As opposed to being like, okay, so it's a big cat, and it's got, I think it's got stripes. Uh, is it looking at me? Hmm, I might, I, this might be a marat, like, no, you're dead. <laughs> so he gives a few examples, well, he speaks about three major circumstances where what is the absurdity heuristic um, turns into an absurdity bias instead, where instead of being a good rule of thumb, it's more of a, uh, a problem. And the first one is that he says, the first case is when we have information about underlying laws which should override surface reasoning. The example he gives is, if you know why most objects fall and you can calculate how fast they fall, then your calculation that a helium balloon should rise at such and such a rate ought to override the absurdity of an object falling upwards. So there's cases where, even though something sounds really absurd, if you have really good information about underlying laws, you, you should not think of it as absurd. Yeah, although uh, when hot air balloons first became a thing, I remember people thinking they were like, well, I don't remember, I wasn't there, but <laughs> I, I've read that people were just baffled by them because here's a very large, heavy object, and all you do is you make a balloon, and they didn't have helium, they were just using uh, heated air. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> That's the name. <laughs> yeah, hot, hot air balloon. But um, it is pretty hilarious thinking about what people's reactions must have looked like to just seeing this gigantic thing just floating. <laughs> Uh, this uh, Eliezer's made a point kind of like this. I don't know if it's actually earlier in your read order because most of my sequence reading has been out of the edited rationality from AI to zombies. But there's another essay where he's talking about how you weigh arguments from authority uh, where if you're actually in a completely unexplored domain of science at the turn of the 20th century, maybe Lord Kelvin saying that this heavier-than-air flight thing isn't possible should carry some weight. Once Otto Lilienthal has built a, has a measured lift, and once the Wright brothers have built a wind tunnel to measure lift in their own way, you've got experimental data that points in that direction. But when you actually see the plane fly, <laughs> Kelvin's authority isn't something that even factors into your calculation anymore. Uh, I see the the way that he's suggesting it, like this should override surface reasoning. Uh, it seems like a good step from this how to stop making this mistake versus uh, into how to actively not make this mistake. One thing I can think of is the Wright brothers looked at birds quite a bit, like diagramming the wings and birds are heavier than air and they can fly. So you've already got evidence. Are they heavier than air though? Birds are heavier than air. (laughs) 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 They do have hollow bones and light feathers, but no, they they have weight. Dead ones ones fall out of the sky. We could do an Archimedes sort of experiment, you know, to figure out the mass of the air displaced by the bird in in a plastic box. Trying to think of a rhyme of the ancient mariner joke about the albatross around the neck, but can't make it work anyway. Um... Uh, he has a second case, <laughs> which he doesn't give an example for. says, attending to surface absurdity in the face of abstract information that ought to override it. If people cannot accept that studies show that marginal spending on medicine has zero net effect, uh, that is a bias because uh, it seems absurd. That violates the surface rule. Uh, medicine cures things. Um, <laughs> but the abstract spending on medicine has zero effect is not quite the same thing. So their absurdity bias is leading them astray there. Okay, yeah. Sort of like a, I guess, global warming, where you can, like... It's absurd that you could change the temperature of the entire Earth by something you're yeah. personally doing. Or like my dad, who's like, well, the, sur- the temperature of the Earth is always changing. Uh, We're not, it, it always goes up and down. We're not doing it. It's just, it's just going up. <laughs> trying to say every time you fart, the summer comes around. Come on. Like I've actually heard people explicitly make that argument, though, with respect to climate change. Like, it's arrogant of man to think he could alter the climate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, everybody knows that arrogantly, the beliefs held in arrogance are never true. Absolutely. Never once has an arrogant person been right about anything. Certainly not the hero of a certain fan fiction. But... I was hoping someone would <laughs> mention that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Third case. Uh, when the absurdity heuristic simply doesn't work. The process is not stable in its surface properties over the range of extrapolation. And yet people use it anyway. Like, the future is usually absurd, scare quotes. It's unstable in its surface rules over 50-year intervals. And, yeah, it gets more into that, and I think, I forget if it's the next post or the third one, but we'll we'll get into that. Yeah, I actually I have an example, but it'll be, make more sense when we get to why is the future so absurd. Okay. He uh, ends with, over the last few centuries, the absurdity heuristic has done worse than maximum entropy. It's ruled out actual outcomes as being <laughs> far too absurd to be considered. You would have been better off saying, I don't know. And the example he gave was a certain person being accused of fraud for selling stock in the radio telephone company, uh, claiming that he could send human voices across the ocean hmm. using radio waves. Nonsense. Yes, exactly. And I believe the Lord Kelvin saying that uh, heavier than air things will never fly is another example from previously. Right. And the next one was availability, or the avail- availability heuristic, which uh, is judging the frequency or probability of an event by the ease with which examples of the event come to mind. Uh, so, yeah, kind of self explanatory there. Yeah, we're all pretty familiar with this one, right? Or at least we talk about it a lot. That, uh, do we? Yeah, the more you hear about things happening, the more it seems uh, like that's a thing to you. Yeah. Which is why, you know, the 
the constant harping about the sins of a subgroup that someone hates tends to be extremely bad and toxic because it'll make everyone around you think that those people are evil when, you know, out of 100 million people, you can easily find the bad ones and keep highlighting all their bad stuff. And yeah. it'll twist your priorities on what evils you actually want to fix because you will have a... Gr- if, if, if that kind of complaining is going on constantly, you'll have a greatly exaggerated potentially a greatly exaggerated impression of how influential the outgroup you're dunking on actually is. Yeah. He gave a slightly less political example, too, in saying that people thought that um, accidents accounted for more deaths than diseases, when it turns out that diseases are 16 times more uh, likely to kill anyone than an accident, because there's just a lot more of them, but you don't hear about the diseases, because they're not, you know, spectacular, newsworthy events. Yeah, or bringing absurdity back into it... um... I think it was in the Camden Aquarium. They had a plaque talking about sharks, and they said that, uh, you know, you're supposed to guess how many people die per year of shark attacks, and then there was a little thing that you could pull up, and uh, I forget what the actual numbers were, but it was considerably lower than you would expect, and they compared it to, like, (laughs) they they, um, said more people are killed by coconuts falling on their head than shark attacks. Mm -hmm. It's shark attacks in the single digits, right? Shark attack deaths? Shark attack death. That that sounds right. It's certainly not into triple digits. And just the whole, like, uh, that's a perfect example of availability because you would, like, when you're thinking about common causes of death... (laughs) Shark attacks, naturally. You'd never think of coconuts. (laughs) No. Actually, I just thought of this, but there is a way that an availability bias can be literally hazardous to your health, at least in the short term. Mm -hmm. Um, it's known among people who've taught medical school classes as medical student syndrome, mm. where oh. <laughs> all these people who are tired and studying constantly and reading about a bunch of diseases they've never heard of will uh, develop the apparently symptoms of the diseases that they've been reading about. And this is so this is so common among this group and so specific to this group that there's really no other good name to give it. Yeah, I think, I think it was the uh, like WebMD syndrome, too. <laughs> I know my mom's doctor has said that there's nothing more dangerous than a patient with an internet connection. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good shorthand. Yeah, I think uh, for some reason I have the number six in my head as shark attacks, although it has to vary more than you know one every year. But anyway, that's a good average. Um, I think the availability heuristic, uh, like, I can't remember if it's, if it's another Yudkowsky post or somewhere else, but like the cell of... Uh, Earthquake insurance goes up right after an earthquake. Mm. Yeah, you... that, that was in this, except they're talking about flood insurance. Okay, yeah. In this post, you might have talked about earthquakes. At I'm, I'm thinking specifically of earthquakes because it makes, like, with a flood, I don't really know how often, like, if one flood influences the next flood, but one earthquake does influence the next earthquake in which, like, when the tectonic plates are agitated and settling and that's what causes the earthquake, it tends to, like, not happen again for a while. Mm-hmm. So right after an earthquake is when you shouldn't be buying earthquake insurance. It should be like, it's been, like, five years since our last earthquake. I should probably buy some of that nice, cheap earthquake insurance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, this one with the floods, they had this uh, sort of interesting take on it where when dams and levees are built, they reduce the frequency of floods and create a false sense of security, leading to reduced precautions. But, like, ironically, well, building dams decreases the frequency of the floods if it floods the damage per flood afterward is so much greater. Uh, the average, average yearly damage increases. Because <laughs> all that water that's been held back, I guess. I- I'm just p- picturing the scene from Oh Brother where thou where the dam mm-hmm. breaks and then there's just houses floating by <laughs> with people sitting on top of their like roofs of their houses and sort of still talking about the same bullshit. <laughs> the like husband fighting with his wife. Well, like a cow flits by. That was a fun movie. It's such a good movie. Yeah. At the risk of annoying Wes with Evo Psych, uh, Eliezer says that selective reporting is one major source of availability bias. In mm. the ancestral environment, much of what you knew, you experienced yourself, or you heard it directly from a fellow tribe member who had seen it. There's no reason to believe that, Inyash. That's complete <laughs> conjecture. So, if you heard of something, it was likely that... It happened recently, and to someone in a very small sphere of, of your circle. No way. Yeah. I mean, you, you might have read it in a book or watched it in a movie in the intestinal right. environment. There's yeah. no way to prove that you've heard about it from your tribe's people or experienced it yourself. That, that first-hand thing is important. <laughs> like, you're, when you're talking about a population that lives in tribes of 150 of scattered over a wide area, there's only so far you can get from representative human experience. And you have, as he says, direct access to 
even if you're an outlier, you're going to have know a lot of people whose experiences are much more representative. Mm-hmm. So there's only so far astray that you can be led by this sort of thinking until you've got a 10-digit human population scattered over the entire planet in so many different environments, none of which we evolved for. And in which all of them can communicate with everyone else instantly so that the most outrageous thing is shot. I should keep this for the Mind Killer podcast because it's kind of mind killy. But, you know, <laughs> it's... If you want one less mind killy, XKCD did a comic about how because tweets travel at a large fraction of the speed of light, uh, a few hundred kilometers from the epicenter of an earthquake, uh, the tweets arrive before the actual earthquake does. Oh, nice. That's cool. <clears throat> yeah, um... That's like, so, like if you heard something extremely outrageous in the ancestral environment, you probably knew who did it, and you could have some effect on it happening again. Whereas nowadays, if one person out of five billion does something crazy and stupid, you feel the same way when you hear about it. Like, how could this happen? We must do something. <laughs> but no, no, you don't have to do anything. I, I often try not to comment on things if I don't personally, you know, know someone who has experienced it. Yeah, um, about ancestral environments uh one of our major benefits as a species is that we keep our elderly alive and around because they're able to remember past events like they they did have the ability to actually see things happen and that gave them better predictive power i remember this thing about elephants too where they did a natural experiment where they were studying two different groups of elephants and in one group of elephants, the, the elders had died off of disease or something. In the other, the elders were still alive. And uh, the there, there was a series of droughts. And the elephants that had the elders, uh, the elders had remembered where the reserves of water were when droughts had happened to them in the past. But the other elephants were, you know, just like the parents and the kids. They didn't have those experiences, so they were much more likely to die off of uh, thirst. Yeah, I remember reading about that. Yeah, I feel like that might have come up in some rationalist context or something, because... The odds of that are increasing, because I also remember that anecdote. Yeah. Or, or that story. Maybe um, somebody... It, was, it, it sounds like something that was probably in Slate Star Codex, actually. He has an example in here, which at the time was not political, uh, but times have changed. So now it is somewhat political, I guess. He says, in real life, you're unlikely to ever meet Bill Gates. But thanks to selective reporting by the media, you may be tempted to compare your life success to his and suffer hedonic penalties accordingly. The objective frequency of Bill Gates is 0.0000000015. But you hear about him much more often. And I, you know. How is that political? Well. I lots of times. Are, are you? If you want to make it joke? political, you uh, can just use Elon Musk instead. Yeah, I was going to say a lot of people are like, "Why don't we take all the rich people money and redistribute it?" And like that makes sense in a tribe of a few hundred people. When you have one person who's super rich, you're like, "He's being an ass." We're all contributing to this tribe um, functioning. How does he have so much? He could share it with us. Whereas in this case, uh, he doesn't. He's not being an ass, and that money split over three hundred million people is like. Twenty dollars or something—it's not a lot of money. Well, and I—I I guess my thing is like, yeah, Elon Musk is maybe. I mean, even he's doing cool shit. I would pick the uh, Koch brothers or some some asshole group. Like, you know, Elon Musk is gonna get us to fucking Mars. Bill Gates is gonna cure malaria. So, like, I those to, those to me are the like the prime examples of like how to be you know an ethically rich person. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what awesome project Jeff Bezos is working on. Maybe he's a better example. I, Isn't uh, he working on like seasteading, or is that someone else? No, that's that sounds else. cool. Yeah. I think just <clears throat> yesterday saw a uh, meme about Batman where someone pointed out that instead of giving his money to the poor to help them out and reduce crime, he puts on a mask and goes to fight criminals in the streets. And uh, the reply was he has 10 to 11 billion dollars and pointing a source to like DC Comics, right? And uh, dividing that by the population of Gotham means that he can give everyone in the city $75 a month for one year <laughs> and then he's flat broke. <laughs> And that's, you know, assuming he sells all his assets. I'm like, yeah, see, that's, it's just not that much money divided up by the... You know what he could do is sell the patent to his self-driving cars and save 33,000 deaths in just America every year. Does he have self-driving cars? He did in the movies. The Batmobile self-driving. He has all kinds of, like, future tech things that don't really make any sense. (laughs) I, I think Batman is a really terrible example of that, though, because when, like, that criticism implies that 
that's the only thing that Bruce Wayne is doing with absurd amounts of right. money. As if he's not also doing like a lot oh, of that stuff that sounds very effective altruisty throughout Gotham. Like his Batman thing is kind of an effort to trim the other tail of the distribution. And can like I'm not sure what the marginal dealt with the the value of the marginal dollar of Bruce Wayne charity actually is, but he's he's spending a lot of them. Yeah. And And you know, he also needs a hobby to stay sane. And if that is beating up bad guys, as long as it lets him give more money to charity, so be it. Just like Tony Stark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't I, I'm not in favor of any argument about how much good you're required to do that says that once you went at the point where you start making yourself miserable, you're still obligated to do more good. All right. Anyways, getting off of superheroes and villains and such. <sighs> <laughs> on to why is the future so absurd? Lack of Iron Men. And yeah. ba- lack of Iron Men and Batman. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when people look at historical changes and think, I could have predicted X, or you could have predicted X if you looked at factors 1, 2, and 3. Then they forget that people did not, in fact, predict X, perhaps because they were distracted by factors 4 through 117. I think this is much less relevant nowadays because we have all recently lived through um, nobody thought that Trump could possibly win, and yet he did, and so... Hey, I put a 40% on him. Okay. <laughs> I, you know, I that was my big moment of uh, everything that I know is up in the air and the world is in chaos, and at, at, at that point I really had a... A good sense of the, um, you know, future is absurd kind of thing where a lot can change because I just didn't see all these factors that, I don't know. For me, it was COVID becoming a problem after swine flu and bird flu and Ebola all didn't really turn into things. Oh, we were so overdue I, for a pandemic, though. I, but like we've, we've had things that should have been pandemics, except that they were handled properly. I just had not updated. I did not realize when the political situation changed, how much that would alter the way that diseases were responded to. And I certainly would never have anticipated that denying the existence of the disease <laughs> would become a matter of tribal identity. Yeah. It's a Chinese hoax. <clears throat> yeah, that, that was weird. Um, we live in weird times. Yeah. Our intuitions about the future are linear. We expect around as much change as occurred in the past. But technological change feeds on itself and therefore has a positive second derivative. We should expect more technological change in the future than we've seen in the past. And insofar as technology drives cultural change, we should expect more cultural change, too. I do think that that's funny. Um, I'm reading Stranger in a Strange Land currently, and that was written in, I think, the 60s. And uh, telephones were, like, the big deal invention that they thought we were going to have in the future. Hmm. Like, uh... In the 1960s? It was, uh... They still weren't in every house then. <clears throat> but it was, like, a, a type of telephone that I think also had, like, a video screen or something. So basically, like, Skype <laughs> the, was, like, what... I don't know. Uh, and there's this one, like, I can't, iconoclastic character who hates phones. Everybody else is, like, totally, like, all about phones, but he's just like, ah, oh, I hate the thing. I'm throwing out the window. He's like, you know what, sometimes I don't even answer my phone, and I was just like, yeah, me. <laughs> You've nailed but, uh, the future, man. Uh, but this is also a, a story about a man from Mars. Uh, like, a human that had been, they, what was it? I raised for, by Martians. He was raised by Martians. I forget how he got to Mars. <laughs> um, I think... Like, there was a group that went up there, and they all somehow died of an accident or something, oh, right. except for him. He was a kid, and, and the Martians took him in. Yeah, and then... So it's been a long time. It, yeah. But, like, like, I don't know. I just find it funny that the culture, though, is just... Like, they, they didn't really anticipate cultural change that much at all. Mm-hmm. And you see that a lot when you see a sci-fi book... Like, read sci-fi books or watch sci-fi movies that were written a while ago, where they will often extrapolate flying cars. But the culture is still... Like, people are still, like, wearing hats... Well, because sci-fi and is always written taking for... taking their hats off indoors and... <laughs> yeah, sci-fi is always written for the current audience yeah. to help help them think about the future, so and we just change a few like, things. So bad at designing aliens, too. Like, I I get so annoyed at terribly designed aliens in movies. But they didn't have much money back then. No, yeah. it's not even the, like, you don't have to... Like, the culture of an alien species can oh, okay. be, be, like enough to offset the fact that you've got like a dude in a suit i've actually been refreshed on that a bit recently uh my own podcast we uncultured swine 
or no, we decided to go back to uncultured swine since there was no risk of confusing it with the other uncultured swine. Mm-hmm. But um, it's covering the first of Ian M. Banks's aliens that I really like the design of. There's no analogy whatsoever to human morphology. They're kind of like octoblimps. Um, the culture is... No. Their culture, because if I just said the culture, that would confuse with the series. Uh, their culture is just this continuous fest of testosterone poisoning. Hmm. Like, re- it would be... It would not do toxicity justice to call it toxic masculinity this is like dimethylmercury masculinity it'll dissolve through a latex glove and that <laughs> from the inside uh, but there you, you can sort of see some bare parallels to a human culture but they're alien they're comprehensible but alien enough that you never confuse them with people they're not as eliezer refers to badly designed aliens elsewhere humans in funny suits right. yeah what was that movie with um the big squid aliens that communicated by squirting ink in circles. Arrival. Arrival. Those were good. Like, yeah. some people are getting better at this, and that makes me happy. But, um, yeah, then there, you, for every Arrival, there's still, like, three or four movies where it's just a human with face putty, or it's a big bug. Yeah, Ar- Arthur C. Clarke's Rama series had some really cool aliens that the humans dub octospiders, whose main, like... Uh, individual to individual communication uh, involves this bioluminescent patch that can flash different colors, kind of like actual cuttlefish. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like if more people just drew inspiration from things that actually exist, like mantis shrimp, mm-hmm. like there's so many weird things that do actually exist that would freak people out if you made like just a bigger version of that that has spaceships. The mantis shrimp has the strongest punch of anything on the planet. It has to that. use its own skeleton as the as the energy storage because muscle can't contract fast enough to deliver that punch. So, like, it uses muscle to stretch its own exoskeleton, and then it sort of hooks it in place, and the punch occurs when it releases the hook, and the whole plate of exoskeleton springs back to its normal size. It's insane. They are beautiful, and they are made of rage. And their eyes... <laughs> They can see all the colors. They can see all the colors. Anyway, um, we're like, like some hundreds traffic. more uh, kinds of receptors than we have. They're terrible. What, how many more? Like they, I, they can see twelve different wavelengths, okay. and they have six distinct images formed by their eyes. So their depth perception is preposterous. Nice. They need this so they can like find things to punch. Yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, their punch is it, it, it lands. So they're in like Goku. <laughs> no, they're more like One Punch Man. <laughs> okay. Their, their punch fair. lands in a really specific area relative to their body every time, so they need an extremely precise sense of their own location. Mm-hmm. I just want to get one as a pet and then like name it Saitama and put a little One Punch Man. But name it Kenshiro. It. <laughs> but like, also <laughs> keeping one as a pet means you have to have like bulletproof glass tank. <laughs> get, a, get a polycarbonate aquarium if you can figure that yeah. out. They will effortlessly smash glass. Aren't uh, they the ones that have a little tiny bit of plasma when the uh, thing? Uh, that's well, th- them and pistol shrimp both do that. Pistol shrimp. That's what I was they, thinking. Uh, yeah, the the acceleration is such that they actually create a vacuum in the wake of the or at the, at the like wave front. Mm-hmm. Water. The universe gets out of the way, <laughs> and <laughs> the vacuum, when, as it collapses, actually generates a tiny infrared pulse that you can see with a camera. Nice. With this an infrared is, camera. This is why I don't think, like, mankind was created in God's image. Because why, you know, there's, there's cooler shit Because we can't punch ultraviolet. <laughs> God gave, like, the coolest abilities to, like, shrimp and, and octopi. And Cuttlefish. Not. I don't know. They gave us the ability to take over the world and possibly fix uh, aging. So I think that's a pretty good one. That that is a good one, but then there's also there some animals that are already immortal. Fixed aging. Yeah. <laughs> well, they but can, didn't but fix can, it. They just never they just fell into that aging trap. Can yeah. they make computers? Right. Yeah. Why do they need computers? They're immortal. Where? How else would you get porn? <laughs> I don't know if you. Do they even have fingers to I jerk mean, off with? I'm sure. Okay, so dolphins. <laughs> Obviously, we're superior. <laughs> like dolphin communication does appear to have like some, a lot of elements of actual language, and given that it can be transmitted over, a lot of miles. And they and they're like almost human level smart. They probably have something like an oral tradition. So yeah. there probably is a dolphin analog to the Song of Solomon or some other erotic fiction nice. buried in the porpoise corpus. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been waiting to drop that? <laughs> I, I didn't. That's like fifty years old, and it came out of the Illuminatus trilogy. Oh, nice. 
cool. We're so off topic, but it's it's like really enjoyable. Yeah. But- as long as we're talking about that, though, the, <laughs> that example I said I would get to. Mm-hmm. Um, people don't just underestimate like technology directly impacting their lives. They, I think, just because of how unintuitive the scientific process is, people don't realize how bad the precedent is. Even when it when examples are pointed out for saying, "Well, science will never discover this." Uh, it in like 2008, 2009, when I was totally an internet atheist stereotype, uh, this one Catholic person that I argued with was very sure that aliens didn't exist because for all of our looking, we haven't found any other star with planets. Mm -hmm. And like at that exact moment in time, people were developing the techniques that we've now used to map the locations and estimate the masses of what we're probably into five digits worth of exoplanets now. They were also wrong in 2008. We had been finding planets, I think, since the '90s. It may be the two, maybe the early 2000s, um, but it was it was emerging. And back then, it was in the at least low hundreds. My numbers might be a little off, but I know we had exoplanets pre 2010. That's possible. I guess part of it is the techniques we had at the time were completely inadequate to identify any an Earth like exoplanet. Right. Yeah, that's fair. We we, we were able to detect the like yeah, the wiggle of a sun that you would see by indicative of having a nearby non sun like a Jupiter sized thing orbiting right. it. Yeah. Apparently, or, the first exoplanet found was one of those big gas gas giants in 1992. Yeah, I knew that because it was brought up in the like re-release of Carl Sagan's Cosmos. I should have just made it sound like I was smart, but um, no, I saw it on TV. Uh, this was that's like, one way to get smart. Some of the updates from the original release of Cosmos, and then when they're like you know the preamble to the the one that you can find now online um, it used to be on Netflix. Uh, I think it was maybe just Andrean. I think uh, for some reason I have Sagan talking about it too. I can't remember, but um, like in the original Cosmos. Dinosaurs being wiped out via asteroid was one leading hypothesis. Oh. Or, like, one contending hypothesis, maybe. Like, okay. this wasn't... Conf- you know, like, you mentioned 2008. You know what else happened in 2008 that seems like forever ago? Like, we can't imagine without it? The mortgage crisis? The release of the iPhone. Oh. Doesn't it feel like we, they've been around for, like, our My whole lives? Life. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. I remember um, being in kindergarten. We were talking about computers, and they asked... Um, like, who, how many of you have computers in your houses? The teacher was sort of proselytizing about technology, which was great. And then they did an exercise where they had blue and red blocks, and you had to put, like, your red or blue block on a stack if you had a computer versus not. And mine was the one that tipped the scale, because it was about 50-50, but my house did not have a computer. And then the teacher's like, I predict that... I forget, I, I wish I could remember what, like time scale her prediction was but like she was like definitely someday everyone's house is going to have a computer mm-hmm. definitely someday everyone's pocket will have yeah. a computer <laughs> on their wrist well you know if we're getting <laughs> weird de- definitely someday everyone's body will have a computer right oh, yeah. and, uh, like if if everyone currently sitting in this room isn't carrying around more computing power than existed on earth at the end of world war ii mm-hmm. they're certainly within an order of magnitude but i'm pretty sure that yeah any of the cell phones here has more throughput than all of the computers that had ever been built combined at that time oh at that time yeah Yeah. totally they were still using vacuum tubes back then there are still i mean there are good reasons to use them for some things i know they figured in like soviet military electronics for a long time because unlike solid state stuff they won't be disrupted when a nuke goes off Unless the tubes break. Well, yes, but... Um, this, this is just like the argument, like, no, vinyl just sounds better, man. Like if, if you're blasted badly enough to, for the tubes inside a tank to be broken, your electronics continuing to work, that, that's not your limiting problem. Right. No. Completely valid. Yeah. Anyway, I was sort of talking on the drive over here about... We were talking about this one, and about people's intuitions about the future being too limited, but I was just saying, like... I mean, I, okay, I remember the birth of the internet and then, like, the whole, you know, maybe everybody will have a computer in their house to the point where people now have, like, a, you know, a phone and a Fitbit and a smart watch and a laptop and a PC, maybe, and, like, probably, you know, some, some kind of computers in their cars. And, like, I've watched you just, machine learning get to the point where now there is a uh, there's a machine learning program that can draw unique anime girls yes 
the waifu generator. Yeah. It, that's not what it's called, probably. But uh, I believe the sign uh, the the site is this waifu is not real. Yeah, this waifu does not exist. This waifu does not that's exist. Wasn't, wasn't this word post? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, there, there's one that'll generate feet pics if you send it texts. <laughs> Oh, God. Great. Yeah, so, like, this is this is the, like, world that I grew up in, so, like, I'm going to be very difficult to surprise, but, like... That's what we all think. You might be surprised. Wait, I know, no, I think, <laughs> exactly. So this is, I guess, a good intuition pump. Um, when he was talking about uh, how people don't, like, imagine things being weird enough, he said, "What? Well, just try to imagine, like, time going in reverse. That, like, maybe you just revert back to being a peasant farmer. <laughs> Except, like, and maybe it's a better future, but it's still going to feel about that weird. I think that variance issue that I brought up with, like, how far you could get from a representative human experience is part of the reason that people's intuition about this is bad. Like, imagine you're in that tribe of 150 people and someone actually invents the first bow and arrow you've ever heard of. Mm -hmm. That's a giant instantaneous leap. But... In that tribe of 150 people, there aren't so many people that you're statistically going to come up with intuitive leaps like that constantly. Scale the population up to 7 billion with millions of people going through STEM programs constantly. Mm -hmm. And like a ridiculous like meta industries that exist just to serve the people who try to come up with these insights. The, the absolute number of insights gets so much larger that we now think of it as a continuous process. But the intuitions that we have are calibrated for a world in which the bow and arrow might be the most revolutionary thing invented during your lifetime. Yeah, so that one ended with, I suspect that when people try to visualize the strangeness of the future, they focus on a single possible change of no greater magnitude than the largest single change they remember in their own lifetime. Yeah, as opposed to all the various changes that are all going to hit. I really First wanna, bow and arrow. Yeah, I really want to interview, <laughs> like I should actually probably just talk to my grandmother. But like, it would be just so interesting to get the perspective of uh you know my grandmother is 87 and just i, I just want to like show her the waifu generator or something and be like <laughs> hey guess what we've got first uh, our posts for next time right sorry they will be anchoring an adjustment and the crackpot offer Ooh.